We'd like to welcome everybody to our uh, to our discussion with Rabbi Willig. Once again, I want to thank Rabbi Willig for uh, all of the help and support that he has given to us in the RCA and to Rabbanim uh, and to the, to the entire Kehila dealing with the very difficult challenges that we face as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. And to thank Rabbi Willig every time that um, we speak to him or we ask him for something, the answer is yes, even before the question is finished. So um, we pray for his continued good health and strength to continue to be able to help us in addition to everything else, to enjoying his family and everything else that he, uh, that he does. Um, but we will we'll begin with a few of uh, Divrei Chizok and uh, I will post to him questions that were sent in beforehand and depending on the time, open the floor for questions as well. Thank you, Rabbi Dresch. Thank you, Ashmatman. Thank you. My first, my first words of Chizuk, Chizuk for the, the Rabbani. Put themselves on mute uh, at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Dre. Thank you. Thank you. We are all in a state of sacrifice. And Rabbani aside from protecting themselves, have to model for their communities that all the laws, all the warnings of the doctors and of the Rabbanim must be observed scrupulously. As Rashi, Someone was sick and went to a doctor. Omelo al tochal tsonein, al tishka betachav, don't eat this, don't sleep there. Bo achavi omelo, al tochal tsonein, al tishka betachav, shlotomos kederach shemes ploni. Ze zirz a yosem in a rishon. And therefore it says, achim el shnei bene aron, don't do this. Don't go into the Kodesh. However, on both sides, we live at a time of Achim Mos Shnei Bnei Aaron. Too many, too many holy neshamas have been taken from us, including distinguished Rabbonim, Tzadikim, Balei Tzdoka, Balei Chesed, and Amcha. Take it from us with this terrible magefa, which has engulfed the entire world. How can we not think of the Pasuk, which is we would call in this week's parsha? You read Sav. Perhaps in some parts of the world it's still read somewhere. Today on Monday, Parsha Shmini. The Om Moshe Aaron. We continue to receive news. Just now got a call a few minutes ago. Holy, holy souls taken from us. Individuals whom we admire, respect, who've done so many wonderful things, who have established wonderful families, who have helped so many people, whose avodas Hashem is exemplary, and they've been taken from us. Bikrovaya Kodesh. Rashi tells us Shakadish Barhu also din with Sadikim Miss Yore or Miss Allah or Miss Kalis Greater Honor is given to Hashem. We see Bikrova Yakodesh pure and ashamas taken from us. 
in America and Eretz Yisrael throughout the world. It's crushing, it's depressing. means we do not question the Rabbana Shalom. We are on our Chadorim. Sgor Dalse Besecha Pasuk Yishaya Chavov Pasuk Chav is rendered by the Medish Tanchum according to Rashi not to be Mahara, not to question the justice of the Rabbana Shalola. The first thing that's normally said at a Kvura at Surtam and Polo. He called the Rach of Mishpat. Even the passing of the great Sadiqim who have been taken from us. At Surah Apollo, that's what these Sadiq would want us to say right now. That's what we have to say. Even as we mourn the loss of great ones and the loss of everyone. All I'm Yisrael, all mankind. The tragic times. But we have to not only practice Vayidah Maron, but as leaders of our communities, now linked by Zooms, WhatsApps, all of artificial technologies, we have to be there for our mispalim. We have to encourage them. We have to inspire them. And that can only be done if we somehow summon up a measure of simcha in the face of the difficult challenge we all face. It's very difficult to experience simcha at a time where you being notified of the loss of dear ones, the great ones, but we're required to do that. On the one hand, to mourn the losses, to pray with all our hearts and our souls for those who are so seriously ill, for those who are ill, whether in hospitals or at home, and perhaps most importantly, to pray to Hashem that we stay healthy. At the same time, we have to be able to experience a measure of simcha. As a matter of fact, if one looks in the Shuvas Rash Bash, that I believe it was Rabbi Biederman, the Magad from Eretz Yisrael, cited, I believe, Kuf Tzadi He. He interprets the Gemara by Bukhamad of Samach of the Beis. Shalom Be'ir, you walk in the middle. But Deva Be'ir, and it's Dadim. He explained that, in my words, the Rambam's golden mean between the various extremes is appropriate in, in normal times. In the time of Dever, Stadim, which means, in his words, stay far away from anything saddening. Rather, a person should stay away from Yogon Anocha and gravitate towards Simcha. Why bit Stadim on both sides? My interpretation. Because our natural inclination is to on one side. The start of Yogon and Anacha and Avelus. Yet we're required to go to the other extreme, the extreme of Simcha. This, the Rashbash says, can, ex- can protect us from a plague, which means yeah. we have to strengthen ourselves, both medically, by adhering to all the regulations, taking whatever precautions we are able to do, and even spiritually. As doctors know, one's spiritual state affects his purely physical and medical state. 
This is a challenge for every individual, certainly for Rabbanim. Rabbanim are often privy to difficult news and challenges as they are in normal times. Yet they have to strengthen themselves to be able to strengthen others. To somehow be misamech themselves, be misamech acherim. We all comes off our lips. Chakosha v'sameach. It's very easy to say it. It's, 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 it's in our DNA. Every year we say chakosha v'sameach. This year we should say chag bari v'kosha v'sameach. Most important is to be healthy. We have to say sameach too. We can assist by all the leniencies we have to pull out of our sleeves this year. So we can be kosher me'ikir adin without all the chumras. This can facilitate a greater simcha in the home. We are in unprecedented times in our lifetimes. Difficulties we never thought would occur. Decisions that we never thought would have to be made. Triage decisions, pikuach nefesh. Staggering, mind-boggling. And yet, the Rabban Hashem demands from each and every one of us to do what we can in our vote as Hashem. As the Targum says in that same passage in Yeshaya, to do uvdin tovin while we're b'chaderecha behind dalse b'secha Rashi's shush pshat b'chaderecha is Botek Nesius and Botek Medrashas. Can't go there. They're all locked shut as they should be. Within our homes, our isolations, and our quarantines, we're still able to do Uvdin Tavin. Rabbanim can be in touch with individuals in Ichizuk and perform many, many mitzvahs, the Masim Tovim, Chesed, learning Torah, teaching Torah. Zoom and other ways, while in the privacy and isolation of their homes. Whoever has the ability to do so should certainly attempt. This is our responsibility in these difficult times. I'd like to share the questions as they were posed to me and try to answer them in order. And if time allows, I believe Rabbi Drach can moderate and have people raise their hands and unmute themselves one at a time for additional questions. I'm following the order in which these questions were given to me. First question, Muta to arrange for Kaddish and a minion somewhere else. In my opinion, there should be no minion anywhere else. No minyonim. I'm against all minyonim. I'm against front yard and backyard and porches. I'm against all minyonim. I'm fully aware of the fact that minyanim can be done in a safe manner. Very well aware of it. Nonetheless, I believe that the mandate of low plug, of not making distinctions, is, should be the rule of the day. I refer you back, I was put on a, a group of doctors, infectious disease specialists, this goes back a few weeks, and the issue came up. One of the wonderful doctors, I believe he's from Baltimore, Maryland, if I'm not mistaken, said, this was, this was done on a Sunday. Sunday, three weeks ago, if I'm not mistaken, we had this call. So the previous night, Motsi Shabbos, was a backyard, front yard minion. Many shoes were already closed that Shabbos, Parshish Kisisa, over three weeks ago. And there was a backyard minion which started with 10 people properly distanced from one another. By the time it finished, there were 45 people too close to each other. We have in our DNA to be drawn to minyanim. Mariv, Mariv, Mincha, Mincha, everyone comes running. It's a mikhsho. I'm against all minyanim. I can't pass if anybody, I know in Eretz Yisrael, there are different configurations and people are on porches and they see each other. It's a halachic question of Rowan Elu Eselu. 
It's not so simple that works either. Not going to the halacha. He asked me a question about a minion somewhere else. I have to give you my personal view. There should be no minion anywhere else. There's a person who breaks social distancing to dab with a minion, puzzle the edus, disqualified from being counted in a minion. I, I, <laughs> there should be no minion. The Mir Hashem, when this crisis passes and we'll have minyanim, we'll find a way to make him kosher to join the minion. Rabbi refused to go to the cemetery. Any rabbi who fears for his life could, may refuse to go to a cemetery. As you probably are aware, the different protocols and different cemeteries, different things are happening. It's a personal decision on the rabbi's behalf, whether he feels comfortable going to the cemetery. If he does, he has to make sure things are done in a manner which is proper. Burial on Shabbat, the Yom Tov, to avoid cremation. Absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. Cremation is the worst. If, the, if there are only two choices, burial and Shabbat, the Yom Tov, cremation, you have to do the burial. As a matter of fact, the very next question, burial on Shabbat, the Yom Tov, to avoid delay, Yom Tov Shani. You may not bury on Shabbat to avoid delay. That's clear in the, in the Gemara. But, Yom Tov is different, and we have three-day Yom Tov coming up. Next week, a, t- a two-day Yom Tov. The Gemara is explicit that one may bury on the first day of Yom Tov through an Eino Yehudi, the second day Yom Tov even for, through Yisrael, Kechol Shavu Rabbonah. In most of our communities, we no longer practice this. We're afraid it'll lead to Chilul Yom Tov more than is, a, is permitted. Some communities, all these years, are following what the Gemara says. Yom Tov Rishon, non-Jew, Yom Tov Sheni, to Yisrael. Well, if it must be done in the years such as this, it must be done. And even communities in which it's not normally done, these are not normal times. And therefore, again, with the Rav's permission and supervision, the Chavra should be contacted before Pesach begins, that if there's a need to bury to a Nachri, Yom Tavrishin, to a Yisrael Yom Tavshini, it should be done. We hope and pray that by the time the first day Yom Tav comes around, we should be out of this crisis, so this last day's Yom Tav, but we don't know, according to the Derech HaTeva, we were in it for a while. So these dispensations found in the Mefurish and the Gemara Shulchan Aruch, even though they've been in disuse in most of our communities, have to be brought up back again if necessary. Shiva over at Chatzot on Erev Pesach. What if Kvur takes place after Chatzot? Can Karo be no Shiva to avoid weak delay? Absolutely yes. Here's a case where Allah HaGadivrik HaMekel Ba'oval allows you to observe Avelis. By observing Avelis for an hour on Wednesday afternoon, you avoid an entire week afterwards. Hospitals, family not allowed. Some allow at end of life, last minutes. I haven't heard that at all. Can go on Yom Tov or Shabbat? The answer is no. The answer is as, as, as we are, Pikuach Nevesh is everything. Everything, Shabbos, Yom Tov, Yom Kippur, everything but three, but three have errors. But one may not drive to a hospital see some of the last minutes of life. It's not permitted. It, I, as far as I know, it's not allowed anyway. At least as far as I know in my area. Unfortunately, <laughs> it, it, this question may not be practical where I, where, where I live. But even if it were practical, one may not drive to a hospital on Shabbat or, or Yom Tov. If, if he gets a phone call that someone is in his last minutes, they will they'll let you in finally. It, um, sadly, it, it's, it's not allowed. Rabbis keep their phones on for Balibatim in distress over Yom Tov? Absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. Now, I have a home phone with a, what we call an old-fashioned answering machine. And therefore, if the phone rings, I'm home all, I'm not going anywhere. I hear the phone. If I view it as a Pikuach Nevesh, I'll pick it up. I'm told that some of the uh, younger members of our community don't have phones with answering machines. They only have cell phones. So I asked them if someone texts them, can they see it on the screen? 
And they said, yes. So again, I'm not a techie. If you see a text on the screen and it tells you if someone's in distress, you must pick up the phone and call back to whoever texted you and say, we have to do what has to be done to avoid this kind of distress. This kind of distress could certainly be a pikuach nefesh situation. And even if it's a southern pikuach nefesh, you have to pick up. Better to arrange with local mental health professionals? Absolutely, yes. They are more qualified than Rabbanim to deal with these uh, mental uh, health crises. Oh, yeah. However, oh, if a Rav gets a call from a mental health professional, and himself asking for direction, or any citizen who calls him, and you can tell by the, by the message on the phone you? or by the text on the screen that it, it, it's that kind of a phone call, you must pick up the phone. You can't pick up every phone call. If they have phone calls come from in, in, a, in an Orthodox Jewish world, if you get a phone call on Shabbos and Yantav, it's probably someone that's trying to sell you something, some irrelevant nuisance call. But if you know that the call is for Bikuach Nevesh or Sabi Bikuach Nevesh, you must pick it up. For grocery deliveries, I've been having to set up orders online a week or two in advance. If I don't, if I don't pay for it, yet I'm allowed to fill a shopping cart online with products that are chametz to be delivered after Pesach. I technically would not own it because they don't process the payment until it's delivered. But I don't know if there are issues with the intent. In my opinion, this is permissible. This is permissible because you don't own it. There's no by by Yamatse. There's no roads of Bikiyumo, which is itself a question that applies on Chamas Pesach, because there's no particular box of cereal that you care about to give you a different box. And therefore, I believe it's permissible. It's a little unseemly, but in a year like this, we are not looking for optics. We're looking for strict halacha. In strict halacha, I believe it's permissible. Next. Many of the food delivery options are very limited in terms of available slots. It can often take an extended period to find any opening for one of these grocery delivery options. Is it okay for people to order food today if the earliest delivery time is on Yom Tov Shabbos to avoid having to go out to a store? Nothing to do with chametz. Nothing to do with chametz. Produce, kosher Pesach items. If there are items requiring refrigeration, can they be brought inside and put in the fridge? Here's the answer. This, like everything else, there are things that people are doing regularly and others are afraid for their lives. It's not a steer, it's not a contradiction. People have different fear levels. There are people who are going shopping and people who are afraid to go shopping. You name it. There are many other such activities. And therefore, an individual who's afraid to go shopping, for that individual, it's pikuach nefesh, even though I'm going shopping. It's not a contradiction. Not a contradiction. So if an individual feels it's pikuach nefesh to go to a store, and therefore must have delivery, and there's no way to have the delivery done, except if it may be coming on Shabbos or Yom Tif, pikuach nefesh. Again, assume he needs the food. There's enough food to last for 10 days, so then he can wait. But if, it, if he doesn't, for that individual, it's considered pikuach nefesh. For someone else, it's not. Now, as far as bringing the food into the refrigerator, it comes on Shabbos or Yom Tif, it depends. If it comes from within the Tchum, within the Tchum Shabbos, it's no problem whatsoever. If it comes from outside the Tchum, then it's a problem. It is a problem. Based upon the Gemara, it's a problem. It's, to be, it's, it's considered to be muktza according to some. But we have a right to be made on the following grounds. It says in the Gemara, and Mesech the Beitz, according to Shulchan Aruch, that Habom Mechutz HaTchum is mutu li Yisrael Acher. So perhaps for you yourself, you may not be able to enjoy that produce or the kosher, the pace of prize, which, which, which come to your house on Thursday or come to your house on, on, on Shabbos. But since it's permissible for someone else, for it did not come to enjoy it, it's not books even for you. So you can put it into a refrigerator. Using it yourself, you should not use it on that day. It comes on Thursday, you, you may not use it that day. It comes on Shabbos, you may not use it on Shabbos. If it comes on Thursday, according to most authorities, you may use it on Friday. Because even though Thursday and Friday are both uh, Pesach, you consider it to be Shtei Kedushas, 
But the Ramana Shach, we're not going to all the, the details right now, that should be okay. Next question is, is, is Chometz. Someone's talking uh, shorthand. Bleach in garbage. Deal with large amounts of Chometz in private trash cans. But the question to me is, is what do you do with the Chometz these days? Here's the answer. You should try, even now, right now, try whatever Chometz you have that you expect to be left with, that you expect not to sell to a Nachri. You can sell anything you want to a Nachri. You can even sell an open box of cereal to a Nachri. You don't sell open boxes. It's you know unseemly. But we have to pull out all stops this year. You can sell anything you want to a Nachri, even if it's an open box of cereal, uh, anything. But whatever you feel you just cannot sell or will not sell, get it out of your house already now. Right now, it's still Monday at noon. In almost all cities, if you put it out now, there'll be a pickup between now and the beginning of Pesach. Usually they sell, they, they collect twice a week. They haven't, if they already collected on Monday, they'll probably collect again on Wednesday. Worst case, they'll do it on Thursday. Still get it out beyond your property line if possible in a, dis, in a disposable garbage can, garbage bag if possible. That's preferred having a private trash can. A private trash can belongs to you. And in the normal conditions, what's in that can also belongs to you. We did chatzer. You can have explicit kavana to be mafkirit, but it's better to leave it in a garbage bag, which is going to go out with the garbage, not in a can which belongs to you. If there's no alternative, you can't sell it or don't want to sell it, you can't put it outside, then bleach will render it inedible. That's, that's what can be done, but that's not uh, an ideal. Once again, I want to reiterate what I said in an earlier forum. No burning of chametz this year. No exceptions. No burning of chametz. The whole idea of burning chametz is only a minig. It's not a din. We pass in Hashbasosa Bechol Dover. Fires are both dangerous, whether it be public or private. And what's worse, it could cause a chil Hashem. The neighbors say, the whole world is going under, and this guy is sitting there burning chametz. It, it should not be done. Please, it should not be done. You can eliminate chametz, by, as I said, by selling it, by, by, yes, what about the 10 crumbs from the Bedikas chametz? What about the 10 crumbs? Oh, every year we take the 10 crumbs in a bag, we throw it into a fire. Not this year. Take each crumb, if you're afraid of, your, of, of causing damage, the crumbs should be small crumbs of soft bread, Put it in the toilet. If you're afraid of damage, take the 10 crumbs and flush them down one at a time. A soft bread. I'm not a plumber, but I can tell you it will not cause any damage of one little crumb, but you flush down one at a time and eliminate it in that fashion. The next question is not understood by me too well. It says, Hashkacha video visits. I understand what it means. Well, the question was, if somebody is giving a local hashkacha and they can't go in or are afraid to go in... That's what I thought. Can that's the what I thought use Zoom or something to show them what's going on? Right. So this, the video, in this case, will be effective. If you put a video camera on a particular place to, be, to make sure that nothing uh, non-kosher is brought in, obviously it's not as good as a, your set of eyes when you're there, but in this kind of extreme case, uh, a video... Uh, could work. Uh, obviously, it depends on the particulars of the situation. You know, if you're having a slaughterhouse, you want to see a video, that will not work. You have to see the the, the, the You can't figure out how, how the shchit is valid by video. Uh, perhaps you can trust the shechet. It echad never be But uh, in, in in areas which are not so sensitive, you're just worried about certain things going wrong a video would be the next best thing if you cannot call yourself. Many people have appointed rabbis as shlichim to sell the chametz via forms online. Does the rabbi have to print out each form and give it to the non-Jew? Short answer is no. Absolutely not. What do you do with the forms? Well, how do the forms get to you? How do they get to you? For online. Oh, he came online. Kibola kachpolto. 
It goes to the guy online. If they email it to you, you email it to the guy. You have to get a guy who has an email account. That's what I plan to do. You have a non Jew has an email account. We'll get all the authorizations emailed to me, and we will send it, email it to him. There's no need for us to print it out, and there's no need for him to print it out. He has it on his, on his computer. It's a little bit emailed to him. Now, is it enough to print out a spreadsheet that lists everyone's name, address, and contact information with the statement at the top of the sheet that they have appointed to the rabbi, the agent? No, you don't even need that. That's, that's not enough, it's more than enough. Send everything via email. Yes, the ultimate document of sale, that is something, whenever possible, should be filled out between the rabbi and the non-Jew. And that, if possible, safely should be given from the, by the rabbi to the non-Jew with proper social distancing. Consider it across a table which is more than six feet. And the, and the document can be signed, delivered to the, to the, to the non-Jew. How do you do the regular kinyanim that we do typically? So we have to be careful how we do it. As far as money is concerned, the money could be slid across the table. If the non-Jew is eight feet away on the table, and he has the money in a, in a shoebox, he can just slide the shoebox across the table to the, to the rabbi. As far as we usually have kinyan chalipin, you have to use something which is uh, six feet long. Uh, uh, you find a, a towel, uh, so you have a, a bath towel or, or, or a blanket, something which is six feet long. The non Jew can have it at one end and the rabbi picks it up on the other end. And as far as shaking hands, which is typically done as a situmta, that is a little bit more uh, risky. There are people still shaking hands with gloves, with masks. If you don't want to shake hands, I understand that today there are various equivalents. Maybe you go like this, or you nod your head. Uh, different states have, have, have actually made uh, orders, you know, government uh, pronouncements that henceforth a document need not be signed in the same paper. You can scan it and send it back and forth which in theory could be done even here. One of the rabbis told me he's afraid to go out. Maybe they will uh, get the money from the non-Jew via PayPal. Obviously, if the person is afraid to go out at all, that will have to be done. We've done that already in the past with respect to Mechira for Tzvila's Kalim. The stakes are much higher with respect to Chomet, so if you feel it's safe with all the precautions to sit around a table, again, more than six feet from it, from a non-Jew with masks and, and other precautions, that's obviously preferable. Someone who's afraid, famous Bikuach Nefesh, you have to rely on even the greater leniency, such as uh, the non-Jew paying with PayPal, and they're not seeing him at all live, it's all on Zoom. That, every every Rav has to make a decision for himself, because uh, again, as I said before, Bikuach Nefesh for one person is not necessary for another person, it's a private and personal decision. Final. Final question before we open it for, for general questions. When is the earliest one can start a Seder? Do we have to wait until Tzayas HaKachavim this year? Any difference on the second night? Uh, a normal circumstance, we wait until Tzayas HaKachavim. Even in a year like this. In a year like this, we're all at home. Usually there's a much smaller crowd. On the contrary, it's even more of a reason to wait. Typically, we may rush things because we have a, such a large crowd and get home from shul. But I don't see any reason not to wait till Tzayzik HaChavim. Of course, when is Tzayzik HaChavim? That's a general question which transcends our present discussion. I would say in New York City, the sun sets on Wednesday at 7.28, 8 o'clock, and start the Seder. You don't have to wait for a longer time than that. Remember, the first thing we do is Kiddush. Kiddush, it says in to wait until for Kiddush itself, because it's after it's one of the Arba Kosos, it's part of CPCS Mitzrayim. But we're not, not discussing any Dorises over here. So if you wait from 7.28 until 8 o'clock, it's quite sufficient to make Kiddush. Uh, if one wants to wait a little bit longer, 
So we'll say, okay, even a tiny bit shorter, we can find leniencies when necessary. But I don't see any reason not to wait till says go home. What is the minimum we can suggest for a person, and particularly the elderly, to say of the Haggadah? Now the question is, is elegantly phrased. To say in the Haggadah. You have to do whatever's in the Haggadah. That, yes. But to say, so there are parts of the Haggadah that are really not required. Um, there are two that are not found in the Rambam, for example, and one which is, even if it's found in the Rambam, is not so critical. And I'll give you the three blocks that can be omitted for someone who's elderly and just can't get through the whole Haggadah. You can you say, I mean, you say, You can skip from there until Metchila over there, Avodah Zara. Those are the two opinions in the Gemara, Kufta Zayin and Manalf. What does it mean to begin with Gnus, Avodah Mayinu, or Metchila? Very wonderful things in between, but they're not critical. You have to start from, from uh, Metchila. You have to go straight. As it, as it says in the Mishnah, Doresh Pasha Dirami Ovid Abikula, until the Tzach Adash Biachav. That's the end. So that has to be said as well. You can skip from there until Rabbi Gamliel Omer. Yeah, we have the 50, the 200, the 250, we have Dayenu, all very nice. That's not an integral part of the Haggadah, it's not in the Rambam. That can also be skipped if necessary. And then, of course, at the very end, once you've finished the fourth coast, that's the end. We have what we call Nirza, we sing beautiful tunes. But again, that's also not an integral part of the Haggadah. So those three blocks could be skipped, it seems, by anybody who was in any Shas uh, of To skip beyond that would have to be an individualized uh, decision that the, a particular Rav reaches based on his knowledge of the circumstances. With this, I complete the questions that were given to me by Rabbi Drach. Thank you so much, Rabbi Drach. If there are others who want to answer other questions, if Rabbi Drach can arrange it with his technological expertise, I'm happy to try to answer. Okay, thank you so much, Rabbi Willig. If uh, somebody wants to ask a question, if you could just uh, type your name in the chat, I'll be happy to call on you. Uh, I have two questions um, to, be, to begin uh, this part with. One is that some cemeteries, I understand they're allowing a minion to be present, but people have to remain in their cars uh, to watch the Kavura. If an, if a, is it possible to say Kaddish if you have a minion, does, or does the car represent a separate Rishul Sayyachid and therefore the people are not Mitzdarif? In my opinion, again, assuming that the, it's permissible to have 10 people at a cemetery. I'm not saying that's true. But assuming it's permissible to have 10 people at a cemetery in their cars, and they see each other, uh, they roll down the windows a little bit, it seems to me it would be permissible to say a Kaddish. But I'm, it's, it's an if-then statement. Okay, thank you. The other question with regard to Yontif Shani, um, somebody had texted, had written on the chat that Sunday is a, is a holiday for the, for the non-Jewish where the cemeteries will be closed. So just to reiterate, L'Chadchila, we can inform the, um, uh, the funeral homes to perform Kavuros on Yontif, on Yontif Rishon and on Yontif Shani. Um, and on Yontif Shani, since the Gemara refers it to it as a weekday with regard to Kavura, is a, is a karov permitted to go to the cemetery, to drive to the cemetery, to be mishtatev in the kvura on Yom Tov Sheni? The answer to both questions is yes. Yes. It would be true if the Sunday would not be a, a cemetery closure. Some cemeteries are going to be open on Sunday. As I said before, we have the rules. The rules are you can do a kvura Yom Tov Rishon to Amamin, to, to Nochrim, and that's a very powerful statement. It doesn't mean that it's, yeah, everything goes. Everything goes. That's, that's, uh, that's. I see on the chat the whole sale of Chomets via Zoom with a non Jew. I mentioned it before that if it's a real Shasat Chak and the rabbi is afraid to leave his house, potentially we can consider doing that, doing that. Uh, by PayPal. PayPal means that the non-Jew will put money from his account into the rabbi's account. And that's what's called Kenyan Kesef. And the document could be signed 
That's what's called Kenyan Star. Even if I don't see him, if he, I scan in my copy, he scans me his copy, according to certain states, that's literally binding. And my guess is by Wednesday, it'll be binding everywhere with the way things are going. Um, on screen, on Zoom, you can put your fist out, nod your head, which is a kind of a situmta nowadays. So that I think would be permissible in a case in which the rabbi is simply afraid or cannot find a non-Jew who's not afraid to meet him in person. I believe that's true in that kind of a case. It's an extreme case. You know, even in, in New York, which is unfortunately the capital, there are individuals, there are individuals who are still walking in the streets and going shopping and other things. So with proper precautions, a mask and if necessary gloves, I think that it's, it, it is considered to be safe. But again, as the questioner raised, if it's not safe, if the person thinks it's not safe, then in an absolute state of, uh, of emergency, I think we could rely on the, uh, the PayPal for the KSF. You have to have someone who has PayPal. And the other Kenyanim, the star could be scanned back and forth. The, you know, the, the expressions go along with the, with the rental of the properties which, for which the star really works. Agav and Chatzar can be verbalized. The, the Situmta could be done, as we said, on Zoom. And what's missing uh, is Chalipin. Uh, uh, Chalipin cannot be done by Zoom. Uh, there are those who wanted to make a calculation, give him something, and then he picks it up. I, 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 he gives you something. I don't know. We can live without the Khalipan. Khalip is one of many Kenyanim. Even if it's impossible to arrange that particular Kenyan on Zoom, we can rely on the other ones. Again, it's only in a situation where it's impossible uh, because of the fear of Corona to meet with a non-Jew in person. So, rabbi Winston writes in, how does a rabbi who was using the online Mechiris Chametz form with Rabbi Willig sell his own Chametz? Does he <laughs> fill out his own Shul's form or does he have to fill out Rabbi Willig's form? That's a general question. I have the problem every year. How do I appoint myself to sell my chametz? So I believe that tech, although it's, 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 it's from gr- grammatically clumsy, the Rabbi Willick appoints Rabbi Willick. I think it works. But to make it better, I always make sure that my wife signs together with me. So she appoints me, and I appoint myself. And I think that's, that can be done th- uh, this year as well on the online forms. OK. Rabbi Yalkut is asking, if someone is nifter, Rachman al on Erev Pesach after Chatzos, and the relatives will not be going out of town for the Kavura, is there any way to start Shiva then, or do they have to wait until after Pesach? You should always start the Shiva then. When it's Erev Pesach, you start the Shiva then, and, 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 and Pesach knocks off the whole Shiva. That's what we should do. Unless the person is, is going to be misasic with the mace subsequently. It's not wise. It's not wise to do that. It's what wise is, especially in today's times, if Chas Hashem was a Petiri on Erev Pesach, the, the, the next of kin should say, Nebuch, Nebuch, goodbye. Whatever that means, it's called Hafchu Peneim in the Gemara Besech, the White Cotton. At that moment, the Shiva starts. If someone is needed to take care, someone else, uh, someone who's not one of the seven crowbars should do that work. Thank you. Rabbi Yasker says, must a person who's suffering from COVID-19 share this information with others? And if yes, at what point? Is it even, is it even before they're sure, assuming that they have light symptoms? That's a, that's a fr- fundamentally, it's a medical question. Um, we don't find that everyone in the world who has these symptoms puts it in, uh, in front of the whole world. Most important is the person should stay at home straight until the 14 days that's recommended by the health authorities. If you have it, you can't go anywhere for 14 days. Can I repeat, you may not go anywhere for 14 days. Even if you are in the same house as someone who has tested positive, you may not go anywhere for 14 days. That's the quarantine as we understand it from the medical authorities here in, in New York. And that means you cannot go to the mikvah, you cannot go to anywhere. You just have to stay home. You have to put in big, bold letters, I have it. I don't think that's a requirement that anyone uh, uh, requires today. The only exception might be if you have it 
and you were exposed, you exposed somebody else. Reuben gets tested positive. Reuben spent yesterday with Shimon. So Reuben should call Shimon. Shimon, you may be exposed. That's appropriate. Tell the whole world. I don't see any reason to tell the whole world. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions that anybody would like to pose? Yes, please. This is David Asher. Yes, please. Um, uh, question is about uh, two questions. One is selling the whole shul. How does that, what is the, the best way to do that in terms of uh, filling out a form or selling the whole shul? We wouldn't normally do that, but this year, um, uh, this year we're not entering the building and it seems to make more sense for us. We're not serving any food. Um, so what's the best way to do that? And the, the, the second question is, um, is there any problem with getting a haircut uh, if the haircut is being done inside one's own house, because it may look to somebody like I, 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 as a community rabbi, went out to go get a haircut or something like that. that those are the two questions. Thank you. First question. Of course you sell all the chavits in the, in, in the shul and lease out the entire premises to the non-Jew. The shul is locked shut. Locked shut. No one's going in there. If the non-Jew wants access to the shul, you have to give it to him, but you say, you know, I don't see why you want to go in there. Uh, no one's gone in there for a month, but of course he has to be given access. But you should sell all the chametz in the shul and lease the entire premises to the non-Jew because there's no expectation, unfortunately, that anyone's going to be walking into the shul. Shul should be locked shut. The second question about a haircut, uh, <laughs> haircuts, you know, uh, who's giving a haircut? If a member of the household knows how to give haircuts, I prefer that the haircuts be done inside. And we don't want to do these things in, in, in the outdoors. It's just unseemly. If no one in the, in the house knows how to give a haircut, I would just wait, wait till someone else, we have, we have better times, you know. Uh, give yourself a haircut, you know, take a scissors. Remember, no one's looking at you anyway, so if it doesn't come out so well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Maria, thank you. Thank any you. Other, any other questions anybody wants to pose? Please speak. You can unmute yourself and speak now. Going, going. Okay. So I think that that is it, Rabbi Willig. Thank you so very much um, for your expertise and for your openness and your friendship to all of the Javier from the RCA and beyond and for the guidance that you give us. We wish you and your family Chag Bari, Kasher V'Sameach, as we do to all of Klai Yisrael, and we pray for Rafu Shalema for those who are ill, and Nechama for those who are mourning. Thank you so very much. Chag Bari Kasher V'Sameach. Chag Bari Kasher V'Sameach. Shreyach Yerav Wog. Chag Bari Kasher V'Sameach.